to be postponed to today because in that week we lost a young wonderful person you will all remember Kaisile Mel Moya May I request all of you to stand in my honor and observe a moment of silence. Vice Chancellor. Vice Chancellor. Deans, heads of department, family and friends of Dr. Magata, a special welcome. Also to her brothers, Gomani and Iso, and her partner, Tunzikasi Mungwana. Students and colleagues, welcome to the Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Teacher Award Lecture. The Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award is made annually to an individual with fewer than 10 years of experience teaching at a university, who has demonstrated to a panel of peers that their work as an academic teacher is truly distinguished. The 2018 Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award was awarded to Dr. Sipokazi Magadha at the Department of the Department of Political and International Studies. Dr. Magadla began teaching as a junior lecturer at the university in 2011, at this university. Following time that she spent doing research for the Institute for Security Studies, she came to Rhodes University to study for a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and Political Studies degree, which she completed in 2006. She then went on to do honors in political and international studies before being awarded a prestigious Fulbright scholarship that allowed her to study for a master's degree in international studies at Ohio University in the United States. She was promoted to the rank of lecturer in 2012 and to senior lecturer in 2018, following the award of a doctoral degree awarded by Rhodes University for a study that examined the contribution of women combatants to the guerrilla war against apartheid and their lives in post-apartheid South Africa. Since 2017, she has served as the academic mentor of the new York 
based social science research Francis next generation social sciences in Africa fellowship program which offers funding and academic support to doctoral candidates studying in six African countries South Africa Uganda Tanzania Nigeria Ghana and Kenya she has worked with doctoral fellows in Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. In June 2018, she was appointed by President Cyril Ramaphosa to serve in the high level review panel into the work of the state security agency. A key course taught by Dr. Magata entitled The Personal is the International is key to her approach to teaching. She cites her in, in pointing out that the First World War put an end to the idea that war is the business only of professional soldiers and that international relations could thus be left in the hands of diplomats. For her, international relations affect, for her, international relations affect everyone and extend beyond war to issues such as poverty, the environment, the media, gender, HIV AIDS, human rights, race, the economy, religion, and culture. From an aesthetic perspective, her lectures draw on black oral traditions of poetry and black church. She teaches with passion and from the heart. And in doing so, she actively seeks to disrupt the dispassionate and rational delivery of lecture, lectures, which has characterized the Western Academy for a long, long time. Her belief is that for many students in her classes, such dispassionate teaching robs one of the joys of learning. Her own approach to teaching as a performance of knowledge and knowing is familiar to many students, although they do not expect it in the lecture room. In teaching this way, Dr. Magada tries to show students that she brings herself and her own history into the classroom, and that in doing so, she is inviting them to respond as she does, to become involved in the knowing and meaning making of international Relations. As ever, it is better to turn to the words of the student themselves to judge the extent to which an academic teacher's beliefs about teaching are validated by the experiences of many. <coughs> One student attests to Dr. Magadha's work in this way. In my undergraduate years, most of my relationship with Dr. Magadha was a figment of my imagination. I was part of the class of 2013 that missed her because she was on sabbatical and our undergrad continued in the same way. I, however, had heard so much about the force of a black woman. I felt like I not only knew her, but that in a world of the unknown, she represented me. When the student did eventually get to sit in a class taught by Dr. Magadha, he had this to say. In my experience, I had rarely encountered a lecturer so incredibly prepared for the class, but also more willing to let the students post, debate, and generate knowledge. Her preparedness alone created an environment where we, as the students, were willing and excited to prepare for the class in order to have fruitful engagement. What that did for us was to create a desire to constantly learn and unlearn. And more important, there was a very based on our own thinking, a sense of our ideas being valid. Another student, now a journalist based in the UK, says, her classes throughout my student years were consistently engaging, interactive, intellectually stimulating, and most importantly, 
they left no assumptions, beliefs, or ideological positions unchallenged. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my singular honor and great privilege to invite your Tessie Conference Magada to present to us a teaching award lecture titled Tragic Comic Hope. Nokusinza is Black Matriarchal Inheritance. nomination 
current and past students. I wish to thank the third year students who were encouraged to come here. And as, <laughs> as we promised, there shall be refreshments afterwards. <laughs> I wish to thank the, my colleagues in the politics department. I wish to especially thank Professor Emeritus, Professor Bishop, Paul Bishop, who was my former head of department and PhD supervisor. Just before I started working here in January 2011, Professor Bishop was coming from a trip overseas where he was monitoring some elections and he suggested that uh, since I was staying in Pretoria, we meet at Old Tambo so that he can um, just let me know what I needed to do in terms of when to pick up keys um, and my teaching load and so forth. But in that conversation, Professor Bishop promised to serve, to offer himself as a mentor. And I'm proud to say that he has done this in a steady way in my almost a decade of being in this institution now as a lecturer. Alexis Amtega. We mourn the loss of Tubego Balani, who was a law student and one of our, of our former students. I still remember giving Balani a 90% for an essay he wrote um, in his first year on the American use of torture in the war on terror. When he wrote to me in the following year, I asked him, are you that Balani who wrote that great essay? He said, indeed, I am the Balani. <laughs> we also mourn the, the loss of the life of master student, Marshall Nyawunge, who also passed away in the horrific month of April 2019. In October 2019, as the Vice Chancellor indicated, in the week that this lecture was supposed to happen, we lost former student and remarkable leader, Gongo uh, Kainisile Melanie Mboya. The history of the student activism of 2015 and 16 will not be told without the name of Gogo Mel Boya. Kanisile, whose name means the one who brings light, reminded me of Dr. Klenam Shopper's poem written um, as a celebration of Mama Nogukanya Lutuli's uh, Lutuli. In the poem, she says, if the moon were to shine tonight, to light up my face and to show off my proud form with beads around my neck and shells in my hair and a soft, easy flowing dress with the colors of Africa. If I were to stand on top of a hill and raise my voice in praise of the women in my country who have wept throughout their lives, not for themselves, but for the very life of all Africans, who would I sing my praises to? I could quote all names Yes, but where do I begin? Maybe, maybe if I chose a name, just one special name that spells light. Maybe if I were to call out her name from the top of a hill while the moon is shining bright. Kaisile, Kaisile. Just as we thought that the year was to end, the year of loss was to end, on the 1st of December, we lost Aunt Bolo Gosini Songaba, who was a doctoral candidate under my supervision in the department. Her thesis was an intellectual biography of the ideas and leadership of the anti apartheid icon Ruth Sehomozo Mombadi. It made sense to me and to my colleagues that a department that has a seminar room named after Ruth Mombadi must produce the, uh, the first doctorate on Ruth Mombati. 
We continue to mourn, to mourn our departed ancestors and hope that they look down uh, on us with favor. We refuse to get used to death and rage against the darkness that has visited our universe. It has been the joy of my adult life um, that I go through the different seasons of black life, black woman life with feminist sisters, many of them who are here. I see Dr. Babaloma Gokwana, Professor Nomalanga Kiza is here, Nolukolo Klapo is here, Corey Nobles is here. Many of my sisters are here. Tapa Tambule Masola is here. Tandon Dumja is here. You sisters are the Sulas of my universe. Like the Sula of Toni Morrison's universe, with you, I feel clever, gentle, and a little raunchy. <laughs> with you sisters who never compete, who simply help others to define themselves in your company, humor returns. I wish to lastly acknowledge Ms. Tina Makubela, who is the 2019 VCs It is black girl magic, but yes. you and I know that it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of resilience that sometimes comes at the cost of our own health. Yes. We celebrate you, Ms. Makubela, for this year and beyond. Yes. So I come into thinking about my teaching through the work of feminist scholar Bell Hooks. I hope to show in this lecture that by drawing from Bell Hooks that my pedagogical practices have emerged from the mutually illuminating interplay of anti-colonial, pan-Africanist, critical and feminist pedagogies. As Hooks argues, I hope to show that this complex and unique blending of multiple perspectives has been an engaging and powerful standpoint from which to work. Expanding beyond boundaries, it has made it possible for me to imagine and enact pedagogical practices that engage both the concern for interrogating biases in curricula that inscribe systems of domination, while simultaneously providing new ways to teach diverse groups of students. So the discipline that I teach is international relations, and I introduce first years to this world I purposely call it the personal is the international because it is my view that all disciplines have um, uh, stories of foundation, but beyond that, that all disciplines assist us in understanding some aspects of our society. The history of this discipline emerges out of the crisis of the First World War the first Department of International Relations and the chair of the discipline was at the University of Wales in 1919. As it was said by the DVC, and as Carr notes, what this moment, the crisis of the First World War made clear was that the questions of war are, cannot just be left to diplomats or soldiers. Part of academic life of academics would be to think about the causes of war and ways in which we can prevent a future uh, uh, cause of another war. So part of the joy of thinking about international relations in 2020 is that we've had a hundred years of this discipline where we are able to assess whether or not it has delivered on its mandate. For us in South Africa, we remember the crisis of the First World War in the image and in the memory of the sinking of the Mendi. The Africans that left our country to participate in that war are a reminder that just because it began in the province of Europe, it doesn't mean that Africans, in terms of ideas, in terms of our bodies, were not affected by that war. 
In the main, the preoccupation of the discipline then has been to understand how states or countries relate to one another. So of course, even in the First World War, what we remember was the crisis that led um, these countries to come um, into war. So as Acharya, Amitav Acharya tells us that um, the dominant understanding of the discipline is that it begins from the history of the founding of the Westphalian state system. Today, we accept that the state is the most important or the highest form of authority. But part of the challenge of our scholars is to say, is to ask the questions, how did the international system become organized around states? So we accept in South Africa that even presidents are not beyond states. That indeed um, the presidents or even vice chancellors are not beyond the state. But why? What are the circumstances that led into the emergence of this um, state system? There is also the argument by scholars like Bull that what is distinct about the system that we have is that it constitutes an international society. So his argument is that this system um, is an international society because countries agree on common rules, on a common set of rules of engagement. Whereas in the systems that existed before, um, states were able to relate to one another, uh, but they did not use the same rules. So we take it for granted today that if I go to a country, I need a visa. But this is part of these rules, these diplomatic uh, systems that have been established um, that define this um, international uh, system that is guided by this dominance of states. And so what the Treaty of Westphalia, which marks the end of the Holy Roman Empire did, was to grant independence um, to the small city-states of Europe. This system of states then becomes internationalized through colonialism. And so I try to make it clear to students that they, if the state system was transported to the rest of us through a process of extreme violence. I then argue that if we understand that, that the state was imposed violently, it perhaps would allow us to understand why states continue to respond and maintain their legitimacy in violent ways. And perhaps then it also allows us to understand why these states are, are able to be captured by sources that do not serve uh, the interests of the majority. I try to also then explain how this in a system of states is defined by this principle of sovereignty. This principle tells us that states, each, um, what it was, each state um, has its legal equality. In, 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 um, even though states are not equal in terms of the economy or even geography, in the eyes of international law, all states are equal. And so the principle of sovereignty attempts to create a source, a source of uh, predictability, predictability among states um, that says, I stay away from your business, you stay away from our business. So when I teach, I try for students to understand how these concepts affect our everyday life. And so as the student, I don't know if they are here, Lungi, Le Kondwana, are they here? <laughs> so they write in their essay in Isisulu that this principle, essentially, it is Jago Uti in Nigeria, Ainalo Ikunya, Logu Genela, Esdabeli, Zase Zimbabwe. We remember the statement by the former president of Zimbabwe who said, Tony Blair, keep your England, I keep my Zimbabwe. In those statements, um, he was acknowledging that me and you might not even like each other, but we are bounded by these common rules um, and values 
uh, and principle uh, uh, that we derive from sovereignty, sovereignty which says um, you don't intervene in my domestic issues and I don't intervene in yours. Even in the everyday examples such as that, of course, of our leader, Zodo Awabantu. <laughs> We accept her as our leader. <laughs> and for me, she is my mother's namesake, so I accept her uh, automatically as my leader. But the principle of sovereignty says that us as South Africans, we cannot impose her, her leadership on our neighbors, <laughs> such as Lesotho, Zambia, um, and Zimbabwe, for example. But of course, even the Zimbabweans or the Zambians who say that she undermines national values, they cannot tell us that she is not our leader. <laughs> but what I also then try to show in teaching about the history of the international system is that systems come and go. If we are able to historicize the Westphalian system to 1648, then it, might, it must mean that there were systems that existed before it. It is upon us to ask whether or not those systems were perhaps more peaceful than this current international system. This current international system that has increasing global inequality. If students of international relations understand this history, then we're able to perhaps say then that maybe in the next hundred years of this discipline, we need to begin to think about future systems that will be able to deliver to us much more global equality. So I use, I was provoked by the Hello. Hi. <laughs> I was provoked by the story. Uh, probably a song says it doesn't make a difference. Can I shout? Yes. And Barat, I don't use a microphone, so maybe let me do that. I was provoked by the historic role played by young people in Sudan last year. They deposed. Um, uh, Al Bashir, the Sudanese leader who had been in power since 1989. And one of the images that resonated throughout the world is the image of Allah Salah, who stood on top of a car, chanting and encouraging the young people to continue in their protest for democratization in Sudan. When she was interviewed, she indicated that the dress the tube, the dress that she was wearing, reminded her of a time in Sudan um, where of the kingdom of Kush, where Nubian queens were in power. These uh, queens known as the Kandake. I like this example because it means, it reminds students of international relations that just because systems um, that used to exist before the state system no longer exist, um, it doesn't mean that they are useless to us. It doesn't mean that we don't have the legacies of these systems in the ways in which we choose our forms of struggle. And so, of course, Professor Mkiza's book was a useful reminder to us about the power of the kingdom of Kush, um, even in their interactions with the Romans. And so some of our energies are fueled by this history that precedes the international system. So if we are invited to imagine that maybe living in one of the most unequal towns in the world and unequal countries in the world, we can say that indeed the state is captured and it doesn't work for us. How do we look into a history, an African history, for sources of African triumph and African political organizations that allow us to deal with questions of structural poverty and other challenges. I also try to make it clear to students that we must again not accept the state system um, as, as, a, as, as, a, 
as something that will always exist. But I, but I make the argument that we must understand that these states emerge out of Europe out of 30 years of war. And the trend in Africa is that these states continue to maintain their powers, their authority through violence. So I like the story of South Sudan because South Sudan is the youngest country in the world. It shows us that this state system is still growing. In practical terms, it tells us that one can be born in South Sudan, in old Sudan, and die in a new country without moving. So I was born in Malene, as I said, in the old South Africa. But if I were to be buried in Malene, I would be dying in the new South Africa. So what the story of South Sudan allows us to appreciate is that geography is political, that space is ever evolving whether it is this state system or the formations that existed before it. So in his thesis, for instance, um, Reverend Isane, who is with us today, writes about the emergence of Makanda, of Mele and Zigana. <coughs> I was reminded by this example because there was a lot of commotion last year around the 200 year anniversary of the Battle of Grahamstown. So while the discipline of international relations was marking a centenary of existence, in this town we marked a 200 year anniversary of uh, the Battle of Grahamstown. I try to draw from this example to say, if the, even the celebrations of Freedom Day um, were made, were done in Makanda, seeing President Ramaphosa coming here to acknowledge the importance and the significance of the Battle of Grahamstown, it must remind us that this, um, the introduction of this state system was not an easy process. It was, it was very much a violent process. So as he notes in his thesis um, in, from 1988 at the University of Cape Town, that no less than nine wars were fought between Amakosa and Europeans. This is important to understand because sometimes um, with young students, there's a tendency to assume that Africans are simply welcomed the imposition of the state system. This, as he notes, um, you know, in the 19th century alone, nine uh, wars were fought in this province. So very much, we are in this town, a central part um, of the uh, legacy and the imposition of the um, state system. In this work, we are reminded um, that of course, this Makanda, whom for many of us, we don't often know actually, uh, that Makanda and Mwele are the same person. Yeah. <laughs> and yet many of us who grow up in this province, we grow up being told that if you are late, uh, sometimes waiting for you feels like waiting for the return of men. In some ways, the gap that we see um, in, in the absence of teaching about this historical figure allows us to reduce his mentioning into, um, uh, um, what into these informal gestures in our communities. And yet, if we appreciate this work, we begin to understand how prophets emerge um, in an African society as a response to the interaction of Africans and Europeans and other outsiders. And uh, and so, um, in many ways, then the the point I'm trying to make is that I try in my teaching to show students. Uh, that even this site that we are is, uh, is, is part, is historically and even now, a part of international history. And I also just want to note that this master's thesis is 288 pages, written in 1988. I'm not sure how many of us with PhDs or masters have written a thesis of 288 pages. 
but it shows the, the ways in which Africans responded to this aggressive presence. And it reminds us that, um, you know, in the end, it talks about how Mwele uh, hands himself over to the British to say, that it is argued that I am the cause of this war. So I hand myself over to the British um, to see if that will end the misery of my people. So he hands himself right, um, and is imprisoned in Robben Island and dies in 1820. So this year for our town marks then the 200 year anniversary of his passing. But what I also try to do is not only um, to challenge students to think about the emergence of the system that guides our everyday interactions. I also try to challenge them to think about some of the key concepts that guide the discipline. So anarchy is a concept that all first year students are introduced to. And in the thinking of Hobbes, the, argue, the argument is that we live in an international system where there is no common power, where there is no global government. And what the system then uh, produces is a perpetual condition of insecurity. And so Hobbes argues that in the absence of a common power um, where that states um, give their power to, we should expect um, insecurity, we should expect war in our world. And so in many ways, um, Hobbes' thinking has guided uh, mainly political realists to say, even if this discipline had a normative agenda to think about ways to end war, if we find ourselves in this context where we don't have a global government and what we have are states who see themselves as the most powerful um, political units, we should not expect that we will find peace in the world. And so I also like again this thinking by um, Gondwana because she interprets this famous um, saying by, uh, by Hobbes that life in the state of nature is solitary, uh, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. She says that um, realism, a key theory in the discipline, in Isizulu, she interprets it as Abantu Ababuga Izindo, Jango Mazinja. And she says, well, Hobbes reminds us that Abantu Bonke, Panonia, put in Bilo, in Bishani. In the Ushukumeza, put in Bishani. This is the theme, the concept that students are initiated to, to help them understand perhaps the tensions that exist between Russia and the Americans, uh, between Iran and the Americans, and sometimes maybe between the South Africans and the Nigerians. Um, the concept allows them to say, um, in the international system, each country has to ensure their own survival. They cannot rely on another country for their protection. And in that way, what the world that we have is a world of self-seeking states. So as the constructivist Alexander Vent tells us that the culture um, that uh, students are introduced to is a belief that we should expect that in the world, uh, war um, uh, can happen at any time um, and each country must operate on this principle of kill or be killed. And what I then try to do is to ask students, us as Africans who were raised under the values of Ubuntu, how do we reconcile this concept of anarchy um, and Ubuntu? Because what Ubuntu tells us is that our destinies are aligned. And what Ubuntu also tells us is that I shouldn't fear a stranger. A stranger is not something um, that immediately poses threat to me. And as this other thesis shows us, is that actually when the Europeans came into the Eastern Cape, the people of this province did not immediately, uh, did not immediately think that um, they could not be integrated into this society. 
what surprised them was this view that then that the people, uh, the Kosa people in this province, had to be moved in order for the Europeans to be integrated. So our values, um, this value of Ubuntu, sits in tension with this idea of an of an anarchical um, international state system, because we are raised to believe that independence um, is how we order our lives. So within the discipline, the liberal um, institutionalists try to make the argument that maybe it is possible to achieve uh, peace in the world if states depend on each other. This is what is known as interdependence. Because they also realize that there are very few problems in the world that can be resolved uh, by one country alone. HIV cannot be resolved by South Africa alone. No disease, Ebola or Corona, can be resolved by, the, by one country alone. The Chinese need the support of the international community to address the emergence of this virus. So in many ways, I try then to show students that um, there is a tendency to introduce these concepts of multilateralism or interdependence as if they are new or disconnected from how we as Africans have always imagined the world to work. So we have always understood that our destinies are connected. And it is only really in the 20th century that we begin to see the rest of the uh, mainly the uh, Western um, states beginning to appreciate the connections, um, that, not the connections, rather, the reality that um, even um, them, their destiny is connected to what is happening elsewhere in the world. The scholarship of Gomoniati shows us that indeed, as the South African Department of International Relations and Visions there are these clear connections between how we think today about multilateralism and how Africans have always thought about interdependence in the international system. So to center this is to say, indeed, um, the, the everyday ways in which we relate in our communities actually can, be, uh, can make a contribution to the international system just because early in the early years of the discipline there was this thinking that all states must act for their own self-interest it does not follow <coughs> that now um, we cannot challenge those concepts and, um, and really show that um, uh, self-seeking behavior does not benefit um, states and individuals and one of the students i'm not sure if the gallop is here Hello, <laughs> 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 these connections between these ideas of liberal peace um, and Ubuntu because he says, indeed, the liberals claim to stand for a democracy, Amalunga, uh, Loabandu, um, even Notando, he says. And he makes this connection then that these are the same values that Ubuntu stands for, self-determination um, and, um, and peace in the world. And so when we are able to raise these concepts, um, students are able to appreciate the ways in which our lives shape the ideas that get ad adopted even by our, by our own government. And one of the ways, the many other ways I began to think seriously about how um, our everyday concepts can shape um, how we think about the international system is the book, um, the biography by Luli Kalinikos on Oliver Tambo. In that book, she makes the argument that Tambo's conception of struggle was that of Indima diplomacy, what he called the diplomacy of Indima. Because in thinking through um, the 
strategies of how to approach um, the, the, uh, the fight against apartheid, he began to draw from his experience growing up in rural Pizana. There in Pizana where they were plowing, um, and he understood that from those uh, every day, the, the one way of going about uh, plowing a field is that you don't just start everywhere. You have to have a methodological way of going about it. What many of us know as Ubusiga Hindi. Yeah, right. So as Tambo led the NC for almost 30 years in exile, his view was that we need to draw from our everyday tools um, where we plow the fields. We need to look at the struggle for liberation as a, a field, a layered field that will need multiple strategies for us to defeat apartheid. Am I going too fast or is it fast? I'm a bit worried about time as well. And so these um, drawing on these everyday concepts is always very useful to me. Um, and one of the other concepts that attempt for students to be critical of for a discipline that claims to talk about war and peace. One of the weaknesses of this discipline, of course, is that it talks about war, but it doesn't want to talk about war as something that affects human beings. So there is this uh, perception that these countries fight these wars without actual human beings being involved. I challenge students to rethink this idea of home front and battle front. Because there is this view that um, when countries go into war, it is mostly male soldiers who fight somewhere in the battle front, who then come home to their women and children who are safely at home. But one of the key contributions of feminist theory of international relations has been to look at history and say, if we look at how war happens, we begin to actually acknowledge that there is no home front or battle front. Wars happen in our homes, they happen in hospitals, they happen in schools. And so once we make that visible, we are able to challenge our own governments when they want to easily choose tools of violence when they differ um, with another country. We are able to say that the biggest casualties of wars are not soldiers, they are human beings. We look at our own history to say, indeed, as we see in the example of Matigizela Mandela, um, and the examples of our own family members who were tortured, who were imprisoned, who left for exile, how we want um, the war for liberation of this country affected um, all South Africans. What should I do? <laughs> <laughs> and one of the moving examples um, from the past week is also this viral video of this Syrian father who is trying to trick his daughter into thinking that the bombs that are dropping in their neighborhoods um, is actually, um, it's not, uh, it, uh, it's not bombs. Um, uh, what, what is this word that is escaping me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm forgetting the word, but the, the father is trying to, um, you know, basically protect this child by saying that these sounds that you are hearing, they are actually not sounds of bombs. Um, but even in the Syrian example, we see that the people that are affected by wars are not just soldiers elsewhere. Indeed, in the war on terror, we have seen um, the devastation that it has, uh, has had on the lives of Iraqis, Afghanistan, um, and the broader Middle East. There are these stories of how young people, young children in the Middle East are unable to play um, outside when the sky is blue. Because when the sky is blue, you 
cannot see the drone coming down to hit you. So again, feminist scholars use these examples to challenge the discipline into rethinking this fixation um, with these questions of, of, of war. And, um, and this idea and this view that the way that a country should show its power is through violence. Because in the end, um, it is the civilians that pay the price in terms of their roles as soldiers, but also in how the war um, actually takes place um, in, um, in everyday reality. Hi! 
citizen. But the significance of this work is to say to students, if indeed the discipline claims to be in search of these questions of ways to achieve peace, which sections of society are they prioritizing? Are they prioritizing the military or the diplomats? <coughs> and which strategies there inform the thinking of those diplomats? And why are these maternal strategies not uh, taken seriously by this discipline that claims um, to think about war and peace? And what Ludwig's concept also um, provoked me to think about is around them the motivations of African women in joining wars of national liberation and their reactions to the multiple civil wars that characterized um, international relations life in Africa, especially in the 1990s. What we see, um, and I draw the students to this case of Liberia and the actions of the women's movement there, the women that came together to force Charles Taylor to join the peace process in Ghana, um, and finally ending uh, 14 years of war. I challenge the students to think about why um, African women use this banner of uh, or these ideas of motherhood as a way to mobilize um, and to come, what is to mobilize um, against violence in, this, in their society. Because it seems to me that whether it is Mama Matigizela, Mama Sobukwe, Africans somehow seem to be um, obsessed with mothers. So what is this idea um, of these Africans that are obsessed with mothers? But in further unpacking this, I also try to think about how in this African society there tends to be a blurring between mothering, between the definition of a mother and a woman. So in English we say it's Women's Day, but in Isindu we say Yimiliyoma. So when one thinks about why mothering is a thing, as a concept, and as a way of political <coughs> mobilizing, you begin to have, if you ground it in how Africans think about African womanhood, African uh, and, and motherhood, you begin to see that these categories are not biological categories, and they are, they are social categories. So one of the students, I'm glad I hope he's here. <laughs> uh, he, in his own definition of feminism, as umdu only being, of course, we can have a debate on whether or not it is only women who can be feminists um, or not. But he begins the definition of a feminist as umdu only being, okolela kuindo yokuwa ama being. But right at the end, um, he then talks about how, of course, there are different uh, feminisms in the world, but all of them, they are commit committed to um, what is it? Who call me? Who call indeed the indeed the feminist? As is Ama, who linger, who who make them the only obom. So even in his own definition, he moves from this, from feminism as being woman-centered, or rather a feminist, as a woman who is against sexist oppression, to feminism being, uh, being uh, a movement against oppression of women or mothers. Okay? So you see that in this African context that you can't make a separation. It's not easy to make a separation between a woman and a mother. And understanding this perhaps allows us to understand why then this uh, category of motherhood was used by South African women in 1956 to say we come together as women, but we come together as mothers um, to challenge the apartheid state. If we understand this history, we also then are not surprised 
as to why these Liberian women also choose to come together as women and all mothers. That in this society, there isn't this clear distinction between mother or woman. But rather than that, you know, I, I, this thinking, this concept of maternal thinking that doesn't emerge from an African context then allows us, um, allows me to begin to think about how the ways in which Africans, African uh, feminists have imagined, um, uh, what is it, uh, their own womanhood and women's role in the society. Because if we think, um, and so I try to introduce students um, to these views by a mind man that a key definition of African womanhood or motherhood is around, is around provision, economic or otherwise, right? And so when women galvanize um, in 1956 <coughs> or come together in 20, 2003 in Liberia, they are saying to the state, that the occurrence of this violence is obstructing our ability as providers. And so this also allows us to better understand, again, uh, the absence of this distinction between a home front and a battlefront. And so we see then why, in the African context, women mobilize um, around this banner of motherhood um, because of the everyday effects of war on their bodies and or on those of their, of their families. But in thinking again about this, in sort of um, demystifying um, the, these ideas of what is a, why is it that African women as mothers, as women, um, uh, what is it, um, why they they why their role um, as when, what is it why they um, so I try to think about um, how um, so the you know this every so even outside the context of war you know, these ideas um, about um, what constitutes a good woman or a good um, wife in the, in the South African or African society. And one of the examples, I like this view by um, Hunter who says that every day um, young African woman is raised um, to think about being industrious, that a key definer of an African um, girl um, as someone who is going to be a good citizen is someone of Kuteleo who is industrious. Mm -hmm. This is the term that I like from Ifia Maidume and in my thinking in, a, in an Eastern Cape or Kosa sensibility, what industriousness reminds me of is that, um, that idea that as a young woman, you don't want to be um, you don't want to be seen as lazy, Ivila. You want to be seen as industrious. And how then, in, in, the, case, in the case of KZN, for instance, Hunter makes the argument that even the ways in which young men think about the kind of wife that they will choose, often what they think about is whether or not this person um, has respect and if this person is going to be industrious. And so he is at the uh, the VC has stepped out because I was going to say that, you know, as someone who comes from KZN, I wonder if when he was making a decision, <laughs> I wonder if he thought that perhaps this one who went on to attain the first PhD in pure mathematics and in, uh, in South Africa, that, that woman would be the one who would help him put the sums together. <laughs> and so the point, what I try to do in grounding, whether it is feminist thought or whether it is political
political realism or liberalism in the classroom, I try um, then to draw on these concepts that shape the ways in which men and women end up participating, um, whether in the anti-apartheid struggle or um, in the uh, in, in, in movements to end civil wars in post-colonial um, Africa. Okay, I'm going to conclude. Okay. <laughs> and so, what I've tried to show um, in my teaching, I, I use Cornel West's concept of tragicomic hope in uh, Democracy Matters. West argues that the tragicomic is the ability to laugh and retain a sense of life's joy, to preserve hope and have hope even while staring in the face of hate and hypocrisy, as against falling into a nihilism of paralyzing despair. For me to teach about international relations in an Africa um, is to be a bearer of bad news in most cases. Dominant theories in the discipline tell us that to understand what happens in, international, in the international system, one has to understand power. Countries with power get others to do what they want to do, what, what they want to do. Whether it is to accumulate nuclear weapons that can destroy all of us, or whether to continue with reckless and environmental policies that are destroying the planet and are affecting poor people the most. African countries are not uh, the most powerful countries on the world stage. So whether one is historicizing the Westphalian state system, African countries emerge as victims of the violence of the system. With all this vibrant youth and enormous mineral resources, Africa and Africans almost always seem to be losing um, in the events of international relations. It is due to this reality that I argue that to think and to teach and theorize about international relations from an African context requires tragicomic hope. Mm. Writing in the American uh, context, West argues that tragicomic hope is expressed in America most profoundly in the relatively honest yet compassionate voices of the black freedom struggle, most poignantly in the painful eloquence of the blues and most exuberantly in the improvisational uh, virtuosity of jazz. As West argues, the blues require that one stare painful truths in the face and preserve without cynicism or pessimism. He reminds us of Richard Wright's definition of the blues, which is that the blues is an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to figure its jagged grain and to transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing it in near tragic, near comic lyricism. George Yancey argues that a blues ontology is a mode of being which is affirmative in the face of existential and social adversity. I am shaped, and I hope it is shown, by black oral traditions of black theology that requires that the black uh, black preacher must stand in front of the, of the worshippers who face unimaginable difficulty, who tries to tell them that the truth tell them the truth and still leave them with hope about the possibilities of the future. As a historian, Noma Tamsanga, Tamsanga Tisane, who is among us, in her article revisiting and celebrating our literary elders to build a multiversal tomorrow, argues that songs in Goma and poetry in Bongo are a mainstay in African oral literature, with children and adult women and men composers as they respond to various contexts, such as oral texts, and reflect popular consciousness. She focuses and the legacy of Diosoga's hymn, Lizarisi Dindalako, which was written in 1857 
upon Sogar's return from Scotland. <clears throat> According to Bongana Madondo in his book about Brenda Farsi, it is said that of Soga that he instinctively composed the song in the winter of 1857, uh, when as the ferry from Europe sailed towards the peninsula and as the bottom tip of the contours of his beloved country came into view, he rose, swept, swept up by emotion, and sang what would become his biggest composition, Lizardi Siding Alako. Today, every Kosa speaker and every school child and faithful and faithless, and everyone in the church, in the secular world, knows this song by heart for sure. As Disane um, co um, quotes the song, Lizardi Siding Alako, which means, fulfill your promise, God, Lord of truth, that all races receive salvation. She argues that Soga's hymn captures his distress as he buried compatriots on his return from Scotland in 1857, when many of them living on dandelions were killed by starvation after the cattle killing tragedy, as well as landlessness. This was a song sang at Madiba's funeral, sang at Madiba Mandela's funeral. This is a song we sang in private in December, 163 years later, and this is a song that is sang at almost all memorial services at this university. 163 years later, as well as memory, we cling to his words that command a fulfilling of a promise of salvation, not just for the landless and colonized, but for all nations, to teach international relations in a country where most of the young people I stand in front of is one in one of the most unequal towns and country in, a, in an economy that is sinking and in an, and an education that is in crisis requires tragicomic hope. Mm. For me is about an education that does not pretend to paint a beautiful and simple picture of African societies in the world, but a system that shows that African Africans are a central part of the international system, for better or worse. Mm. In my teaching, I hope that the way that we see and theorize about the world is reflective of our different cosmologies. I hope that students are able to see that part of being an engaged student is to see the ways in which different worldviews and world sense align and differ in their engagement with central concepts of the discipline. In grounding key, <coughs> international relations concepts on everyday African reality and concepts. I hope that students understand that they don't come to the classroom as empty vessels. The classroom must allow for the rare space where they take joy and challenge various versions of how the world is and ought to be. Ukuzinza then for me means that students take their environment as interesting and worthy of theorizing. Yes. Even if the reality of the environment in Africa, in the international system, um, disposes of both Africa and Africans. Thank you.